Hey everybody, welcome back to the textual analysis of the Hebrew Bible series. Today we're going to be looking at the first part of our treatment of Isaiah 7-2. Before we begin, however, please be sure to subscribe to the channel, click the bell below to be notified when future lessons are published, and please be sure to share this video on social media and to leave a comment below. All right, let's get started. All right, so let's read the text. Vayugad levet David lemor, nacha aram al Vayana levavo u levav amo, kenoa atse yaa, mipne ruach. Vayugad levet David lemor, nacha aram al Ephraim. Vayana levavo u levav amo, kenoa atse yaa, mipne ruach. And now slowly. Vayugad levet David lemor, nacha aram Al Ephraim, Vayana Levavo, Ulvav Amo, Kenoa Atseya Mipne Ruach. Okay, so the first word in this text, Vayugad, is a hofal, a rounded H form, Vav consecutive, third person, masculine singular of the root Nun Gimel Dalit. Nun Gimel Dalit. And the nun has assimilated to the gimel, hence the dagesh. The reason for the dagesh in the yud is due to the fact that it is a vav consecutive. And this form means, and it was told, or you could translate, now it was told. I've mentioned in previous videos that, you know, you want to take some time to consider how to translate vav, especially when you have these vav consecutives. It's not always best to go with and. In fact, you could leave the vav untranslated, and that would read perfectly fine. Vayugad, it was told, levet David. Levet is a prepositional phrase. The preposition le is followed by the construct noun vet. The bet is... In the word vet lacks the dagesh because it is preceded by a vowel. And if you're unclear on that rule, see the rules of Beged Kefet letters. So it was told to the house of David, David. It's worth note that the vav here is a consonant because it has its own vowel. So it was told to the house of David, saying, Lemor, this is an infinitive construct in the G stem or the call of the root Aleph Mem Resh. Aleph Mem Resh. So it was told to the house of David, saying, and I should mention that the infinitive construct Lemor really just serves as a punctuation mark. I often translate it simply with comma quotation marks. I don't believe it is best to translate the word saying because it is really serving as nothing more than punctuation. The next word, nacha. This is a third masculine singular suffix conjugation in the G stem or the call. Note the stress on the first syllable is a third feminine singular suffix conjugation of the root nun chet he. Now, this form is analyzed in the lexica as of the root nun chet he, nun chet he, but it functions as a feminine singular verb, as indicated by the retraction of stress to the first syllable. It is nacha, not nacha. The spelling that we have here with the stress is what we would expect to see if the root was nun vav chet, which is a well-attested root in the Hebrew Bible. It appears that this feminine singular form of nun chet he has morphed unexpectedly on analogy with the feminine singular suffix conjugation of nun vav chet. So who has entered into league? Aram, Syria, has entered into league Al Ephraim. We have to translate this as with Ephraim. Ephraim here refers to the northern kingdom of Israel as it does elsewhere in the scriptures. The next word, Vayana, is a vav consecutive, third masculine singular, call 
of the root nun vav ayin. And it means, and it shook, and it shook. What shook? Levavo, his heart, or it's often better to translate levav as mind. So his mind shook. As well as, u levav, as well as the mind, or if you want, the heart of. Levav here is a construct. So, as well as, u levav amo, his people, or its people. Whether you translate the o suffix here as his or its depends on whether you think the previous O suffix on the vavo refers to Ahaz or the house of David. You could go either way on that. Kinoa, this is the preposition k plus the infinitive construct of nun vav ayin. As the shaking of, as the shaking of atseya'a, atse is the plural construct of eights, the trees of, as the shaking of the trees of ya'ar, a forest. Mipne means before, literally from the face of, but nobody's going to translate it like that. It Mipne means before. This is a commonly used form in modern Hebrew as well. Mipne um, ruach, before the wind. Now, notice the article is not there in Hebrew, but you have to supply it in English for it to make sense. The first word, vayugad, has the diamond-shaped revia accent, which is then followed by mehupach on levet, which is then followed by pashta on david, and finally zakef katan on lemor. And zakef katan is a major disjunctive accent, and so it's no coincidence that we naturally punctuate with a comma where Lemor occurs here. So this sequence shows up in Isaiah 7.1, although the Ravia precedes the Mehupach by a number of words. We have it, of course, in Isaiah 7.2. It shows up next in Isaiah 7.8, 7.18, 7.25, and so we can see that this is a common enough accent pattern. On the word nacha, we have the mercha accent underneath the nun, but underneath the chet, we have the metheg or the gaya, which is there to indicate that the vowel should be fully pronounced. Aram then has tifcha. Al does not receive an accent because it is attached to Ephraim by Makaif, which has the Atnach. And we see this plenty of times. Isaiah 1-2 is the first occurrence in the book of Isaiah. Ki Adonai Diber, because the Lord has spoken. And it occurs numerous times in the subsequent chapters, including Isaiah 6-1, on the phrase, Yoshev al Kise Ram Venisa sitting on the throne, high and lifted up. And then in Isaiah 7, we see it here in verse 2. It'll show up again in verse 5, verse 7, verse 8, and so on. The Atnach, of course, on Ephraim is a major disjunctive accent. Vayana has Mehupach. Levavo has Pashta. Ulvav has the conjunctive munach, and Amo has zakef katan, so this is very similar to the first phrase, vayugad levei david lemor. We see mehupach pashta zakef katan in Isaiah 7.1. In 7.2 here, we also have that at the beginning of 7.2, as I mentioned, and that exact sequence is found in 7.13, 7.16. 719, and elsewhere. And then it closes off with mercha tifcha siluk for the last phrase, kenoat se ya'a mipneruach. Okay, now let's take a look at the Masora. We're looking at the Leningrad Codex. And you can see that verse 2 uh, begins here. There's the Sof Pasuk at the end of verse 1. 
So we have Vayugad, Levet, etc. Now, as we skim the text, we see that there are three Sersili. The first one is above Nacha, Nacha, which points us over to the Masoretic note Gimel for three times. The second one is on Ulvav, Ulvav, you see it right there, which points us to the He, which means five times. And then finally, Kenoa, Kenoa, which has a Lamed, and Lamed means one time. Remember, Lamed is short for the Aramaic word Leta, there is not another, Leta. Looking over at the Aleppo Codex, we see that verse 2 begins here. There's the word Vayugad. And we see that there is a Sersilis over Nacha, which points to the Gimel. And there is a Sersilis over Kenoa, which corresponds to the Lamed. But there is not one over Ulvav. And this is to be expected uh, as you can see in my book, the Subloco Notes in the Former Prophets of Bibli Hebraica Stuttgartensia, and as Yossi Ofer discusses in his book on the Masora, there's not a one-to-one -one correspondence between the Masoretic Notes of one manuscript and the others. All right, so the first Masoretic Note that we discussed is Nacha, Nacha, which, as you can see, is three times. In Dotan and Reich's Thesaurus, they're directing us to uh, 2 Kings 2.15, 2 Kings 2.15. And so if we scroll up, they deal with Nacha here. Now, I want you to note that this is under the entry Nun Vav Chet, Nun Vav Chet. So let's take note of that in light of the comments that I made previously. So at 2 Kings 2.15, the Masoretic note is Gimel, that means three times, but then it has this clarification, which means with this accent, with this accent, which Dotan and Reich rightly explain means Melel. The Masora is not talking about a specific cantillation mark. What they're talking about is that the accent or the stress falls on the penultimate syllable, the next to last syllable, as opposed to nacha, nacha. So with hollow verbs like nun vav chet, for instance, or bet vav aleph, there is a difference in meaning when you have the two root letters, in this case nun and chet, with a he suffix. Part of the reason for this note is that the placement of the stress affects the grammatical analysis and therefore the meaning. Nacha is a suffix conjugation, past tense. Nacha would be a feminine singular participle. So what are the three instances? 2 Kings 2.15, Isaiah, Yeshayahu, Isaiah 7.2, and then finally, Isaiah 14.7. Note that they don't rewrite the Yud Shin for Isaiah. They just put the two lines in. It's understood that that means the same book as before. So, Yeshayahu, Isaiah 14.7. So, comment one says, En ela shalosh talalu, which means there's no other than these three instances. It's important to point out, though, that the Masora is often inconsistent in the inclusion of strictures. So in this case, in 2 Kings 2.15, there is a stricture three times with this accent. But when we look at the Masoretic note for one of these three, Isaiah 7.2, the Masoretic note simply says three times. Okay, so Nacha is the first form that we discussed. Kinoa, as we discussed, has a Lamed, and that just means one time, there is no other. And then Ulvav has the note He. And the five forms that are listed are Isaiah 7-2, that's the entry. Number two is Yeshayahu, Isaiah 19-1. The third one is Isaiah 32, Lamed here functions as a 30, so 32-4. The fourth occurrence is Daniel 4.13, Daniel 4.13, and then finally, Daniel 7.4, Daniel 7.4.
you'll notice that there is an index number one next to the hay, where it says, in numbers four and five, so the entry is from the Aramaic portion of the scripture because Daniel 4.13 and 7.4 are written in Aramaic. Now it's very important when you look at the manuscripts to carefully consult the page in its entirety. And this becomes evident when we search the Dotan and Reich Thesaurus because Vayugad, the very first word of the verse, has an entry for Isaiah 7.2. The double paragraph symbol means that there is a Masora Magna list. Note that there is no Masora Parva note. There's just a Masora Magna list. And what it says is, Vayugad occurs 24 times, Kaf Dalit, 24 times, Visimanehon, and these are their, their catchwords or catchphrases. Okay? And so they are all given here. We see that Vayugad occurs at Genesis 22.20, 20, Genesis 27.42, etc. So when we zoom out and look at the manuscript, we find that at the bottom of the folio, indeed, there is the Masora Magna list. And you can see right here, Vayugad, Kaf, Dalit, Visimanehon, etc. So the point is that just because there is no Masora Parva note and there's no Sersilis, that doesn't mean there's no Masora Magna list. All right, so let's have a look at Isaiah 7-2 in the Dead Sea Scrolls and compare it with the Masoretic text. We can see that Vayugad Levate in the first line here is spelled exactly the same. The orthography is the same. Remember, of course, the Dead Sea Scrolls are not going to have vowel signs, cantillation marks, um, and other diacritical marks because those were developed later on. We see that there is a difference in the spelling of David. In the Masoretic text, there is a Yud. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, there is a Yud. In the Masoretic text, there is not. Furthermore, in the word Lemor, the O vowel is represented with a Vav. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, that is not present in the Masoretic text. Nacha, Aram, Al is all there. Ephraim, spelled the same way. Vayana. Now notice that after Vayana, we have Levav, Amo, whereas the Masoretic text has Levavo, Ulvav, Amo. So the text according to uh, 1Q Isaiah is not his heart shook and the heart of his people. It's just the heart of his people shook. Levav Amo. Now, interestingly, Kinoa lacks the Vav in 1Q Isaiah, whereas it is present in the Masoretic text. Atze is spelled the same, Hayyar. The definite article appears here where it does not in the Masoretic text. And then Mipne Haruach, we have the form Haruach in 1Q Isaiah, whereas we do not in the Masoretic text. So the differences between 1Q Isaiah and the Masoretic text as presented in the Leningrad Codex are minor. Now, just really quickly, I want to compare uh, the English translations of the Targums and the Septuagint. On the right, we have the Targum where it says, And it was told to the house of David, saying the king of Aram has joined up with the king of Israel to come against it. Then his heart and the heart of his people were cast down like the trees of the forest from before the wind. So subtle differences. Um, note that it has his heart and the heart of his people. And so the Aramaic here reflects the reading of the Masoretic text against 1Q Isaiah. The Septuagint, all the way on the right, has, and it was reported to the house of David, um, Dawid, saying, Aram has made an agreement with Ephraim, and his soul and the soul of his people, not a bad translation, were agitated as when a tree in the forest is shaken by the wind. So there's nothing really different there, nothing substantially uh, different. And notice that the Septuagint also has his soul and the soul of his people, which would agree with the Masoretic text against 1Q Isaiah.
If you've enjoyed this video, please be sure to subscribe to the channel, click the bell below so that you'll be notified when I publish future lessons, and please be sure to share this video on social media and leave a comment below. See you next time, everybody.